Hello, hi, this is Dr. Scott Hutchison and thanks for uh, joining us uh, today on Hutchison's Huddle. Um, we have, um, today we're gonna cover uh, body mass index and how it affects fertility and how we're um, gonna hopefully improve things. Um, so um, yeah, so we've had a lot of interest in that. There's always, that uh, topic is always percolating around um, uh, and especially now that the majority of Americans are either overweight or obese, it is um, a uh, very pertinent topic um, and, uh, and lots and lots of patient questions. So, um, and remember, you can always, uh, you know, go back and look at, at these uh, Facebook Live uh, uh, sessions, uh, which are archived, and, um, and there's lots of good, interesting ones there. And, uh, a lot of my uh, other uh, physician friends who are uh, talking about different topics like endometriosis or uh, hypothalamic dysfunction, all kinds of good stuff. So if you want to go back and look at those on our Facebook page, that'd be great. Um, so we'll just take about uh, maybe 20 um, minutes or so, 20, 30 minutes to go over um, uh, how overweight and um, uh, stuff like that affects uh, fertility. Um, uh, all, I think most of us are, have been aware for, for quite a while that the, um, that there's sort of an epidemic in, um, in the developing world of, uh, of overweight. And, uh, that probably is, uh, caused by, um, factors like epigenetic modification. So, and that's where what has happened even to your relatives years and years and years ago um, then has spillover effects on your health. And the way that happens is that uh, your ancestors, for example, if they are starved or if they are frightened and uh, under a great deal of stress or if they are fed a lot of refined carbohydrate, then you as even a third or fourth generation person down the road uh, may have all, m much worse uh, and altered health outcomes, um, such as obesity and uh, a predisposition to type 2 diabetes. So, and I think you, I think we talked about this before, but there was a paper that was published last year that showed that uh, men who are living in Holland today um, are about three times more likely to be obese if their grandfathers were in their great grandmothers during the Dutch famine winter of 1944. Uh, and that's where the Nazis were trying to starve out the Dutch. A lot of, uh, of uh, well, the, the majority of the Dutch population was being starved, including the pregnant women. And so all you gotta do is starve pregnant women and uh, three generations later, you got trouble. So um, a lot of this stuff is beyond our control. We're just sort of trying to pick up the pieces and do the best we can to lead healthy and happy lives. Um, that's always uh, the goal here. Um, so um, anyway, so I, I and I, I wanna talk a little bit about, uh, and then genetics, l l genetics also play a role in all of this. So your genes, you have the, the information that's coded into your, um, into your DNA, those, you know, there are people who are going to, to have um, genes that uh, make it, easier for them to gain weight, harder for them to lose weight. But then also these epigenetic or environmental factors can alter how their DNA is read. And so that's really the whole epigenetic part of things. Um, and that, and those are the things that can last, you know, for many generations. So transgenerational uh, effects. And that's probably why we see a lot of polycystic ovary syndrome now, where before uh, that disease was just rare as hen's teeth. You know, polycystic ovary syndrome was first described in 1935. And uh, the, even when I was in training years and years ago, the, the number of cases, even in a tertiary medical center um, was relatively low. Now it's, you know, I'll see several patients a week with polycystic ovary syndrome and uh, most likely then their daughters are going to have polycystic ovary syndrome as well. So we just have to kind of, you know, manage it as best we can. Um, America is obsessed with beauty and, well, I think all the developing world, um, uh, beauty and uh, there tends to be a lot of shaming for uh, people who are overweight. Um, I remember when I was about 40 pounds overweight, um, it was just a, just a horrible time trying to lose that weight before I had figured out kind of what worked for me. 
Um, and uh, I remember feeling very self-conscious about it. And, I, and certainly I think it's far worse for women than it is for men. So on the one hand, you know, we have all these magazines that have all of these people who are like super, super fit. And then on the other hand, most of the rest of us are, um, are carrying extra weight and having a hard time getting it off. Um, well, anyway, the, so I want you to kind of leave the whole uh, idea of the, how you look and, and beauty and all that stuff and just kind of ditch that and just say, you know, I would just, you know, let's, let's focus on being healthy and um, trying to, uh, you know, again, lead healthy, happy lives with healthy, healthy relationships, healthy pregnancies, healthy kids, and uh, try to do the best we can. So um, I think that the, uh, you know, as far as, you know, people have always said, oh, gosh, you know, if you're overweight, you're going to have a harder time getting pregnant. And some of that is due to the fact that um, adipose tissue is an endocrine organ in its own self. So it makes other hormones. Um, it also tends to have a lot of blood supply. So, for example, um, whenever we're giving people fertility drug for, say, for an IVF cycle, they're going to need to sop up a, you know, way more drug necessarily than, um, than they would have had to if, they were, if there was less blood vessels to, to have to fill up. So, um, so people who are carrying extra weight tend to have less vigorous response with IVF stimulation. Um, Y'all are probably aware that the risk of miscarriage is higher, the risk of stillbirth is higher. But hey, let's just you know get right to the, the to the punch here. The you know overweight is a poor marker for what's really going on as far as health. So, and, and there are people who can remain um, very healthy and be morbidly obese. My grandmother lived to be 86 and only died because she broke her hip. Um, and she'd been uh, morbidly obese for probably 40 years or 50 years before that. So some people do very well with it. Other people will not. Um, so the, I think that what we want to focus on is instead of just worrying about weight and kind of how our pounds are, we need to worry about how our gut bacteria are working and what we're eating. And um, you probably have heard me say this before, but really the the main thing about um, your food, your food is to feed mainly your little friends in your back, your gut. Um, and those bacteria outnumber us by about, you know, tenfold as far as numbers of cells. And uh, the bacteria that are really helpful for people for helping, you know, maintain good insulin sensitivity and um, uh, also also tend to really affect mood and behavior in a big way. So um, the bad gut bacteria tend to alter our mood and behavior, tend to make people have more cravings, uh, more predilection towards using uh, substances like alcohol and um, other recreational drugs. Uh, so eating really, really healthy food, um, I want you to think of as being sort of a, a, a ticket towards um, better sleep, better behavior, better bowel function. And the spillover of that is that if you have that good lactobacillus dominant type gut flora, then you also have better vaginal flora. And that better vaginal flora also then winds up getting into the uterine cavity. And uterine cavity is extremely difficult to culture. Um, it really defies really good culture. There's a test um, that is, um, will hopefully be out in the United States. It's in Europe right now, uh, but it's a transcriptome analysis of the bacteria that live in the uterine cavity. And uh, hopefully, it's supposedly gonna be out in December, and I think that uh, we're gonna be doing that uh, fairly routinely for, for most people um, who've had like IVF failure and things like that to try to figure out, you know, how we can affect their good bacteria in their uterine cavity so that uh, the uh, good bacteria um, will, uh, you know, protect their embryos from harm from the bad bacteria. Um, the good lactobacillus uh, that, that uh, live in the, in the gut and the vagina and the endometrium, they tend to make acid as a by product of their metabolism. So they tend to lower the pH of uh, those fluids and that tends to uh, be pretty inhospitable to the bad bacteria. So bad bacteria tend to go away. Um, so a lot of you have heard of uh, 
uh, bacteria called like Clostridium difficile and Peptostreptococcus. And these, those kind of freeloader bacteria can not just, uh, you know, not give us good insulin sensitivity, but they also can make us, um, you know, not sleep as well and, uh, you know, have more gas, have constipation. And then if occasionally if they overgrow, they can really cause uh, massive diarrhea and, uh, and, and can kill you. So, um, so then, then the big question is, how do you get those really good gut bacteria going? Well, if, if you eat lots and lots of vegetables, lots of um, leafy greens, and it appears that if you eat uh, pickled things like kimchi and uh, active culture sauerkraut, then those, uh, those foods have those good bacteria kind of laced all the way through those pickled vegetables and that allows for those bacteria to make that transit through the stomach, which is very, very acidic, way more acidic than, than the vagina, to be able to get into the intestine where they need to go. So just drinking a probiotic or drinking kombucha is a pretty inefficient way to get uh, those good bacteria down into the intestine. So I would encourage all of you to eat a couple tablespoons of kimchi uh, or uh, active culture sauerkraut um, like Bubby's or Napa Brinery, or yeah, there's tons of them, or you can you look online, make recipes of your own. But um, traditionally, these were these were food storage devices for uh, for uh, keeping vegetables uh, good through the winter so that you would actually have some to eat. Um, kimchi is from Korea. Um, it was traditionally clay pots stuck in the ground and where they would ferment the vegetables. It's typically um, cabbage, onions, and peppers, um, sometimes fish sauce. But, uh, you know, and a lot of a lot of us uh, in the States have kind of held our nose and, until we kind of got to like it. But I would encourage you to, to try that. Um, I, I think kimchi is fantastic um, under soft boiled eggs for breakfast in the morning. It, it really is good. And there's there's several uh, varieties of kimchi out there now. Um, the one I had recently is called Mother-in-Law. There's uh, Kings. There's uh, there's a whole bunch of them that you can find, but make sure they have the active cultures in them. They usually will tell it. They'll they'll have a little warning on there. Open it over the sink, or it may spill over. Um, there's variable spiciness to the kimchi. Most of the ones that you can buy in the store are not too bad. Um, uh, as far as the sauerkrauts, um, the uh, you know the you know, they're awesome too. With any of these, I would just start slow. I wouldn't go with more than a couple tablespoons on your first go round, even if you, you really find it tasty because it really may alter your flora enough to where if you eat a whole bunch of it, you may get diarrhea for a few days. Um, so then the other part of getting good gut flora is not killing off your good gut bacteria with things, harmful things to eat. So the things that are the most harmful for gut flora are, um, it looks like, are some of the preservatives like uh, trilose and um, artificial sugars. So the things like aspartames and the even the naturally occurring uh, artificial or the sugar-like uh, molecules like xylitol and sorbitol, these are, are, and I don't know that sorbitol is naturally occurring, but xylitol is, mannitol is, uh, I think, naturally occurring. But all of these tend to be very, very hard on the, the very good, fragile gut bacteria. So I would encourage you to go really light on, on uh, like sugar-free gum. Well, you shouldn't eat sugar gum either because it hurts your teeth, but um, sugar-free gum is, is probably not a good, good thing for you. Uh, the um, diet sodas are just as bad as regular soda. I mean, honest to God, we need to put taxes on those things because they really are causing a huge amount of harm in this country. Um, and, or, and even diet soda is strongly associated with childhood obesity. So, um, it certainly is not diet by any stretch of the mean, any stretch at all. Um, and, uh, and I wouldn't eat a lot of processed, uh, meats. Um, all of these things tend so hot dogs, hams, things like that, bacon. And, um, I think, you know, pretty sparingly because all of this stuff may be the preservatives that are in there, the, those agents, um, even if they say that they're uncured, they still have a lot of nitrite, um, which is coming in from either cherry powder or celery uh, powder. And that may be fairly damaging to your gut flora. Um, certainly if you want to eat celery, fine. But, uh, you know, like having these weird concentrated um, 
uh, amounts of nitrate uh, are, are probably not really good for you and good and probably not good for your gut bacteria. Um, it's fascinating when you see people who are um, who've been who've grown up in the third world in, in developing countries and not exposed to any processed food when the scientists have looked at the cultures of their back of the, their gut flora um, by culturing their stool samples, the, the depth and breadth of the amount of good gut bacteria they have is just phenomenal compared to what we have here. Um, when they move to a developing uh, country and they start eating processed food and then they have their gut recultured, the number of good gut bacteria drop dramatically. So I would really encourage you eat eat as clean as you can, eat a lot of organic food um, as much as you can as well. Um, or, or try to try to grow your own if you can. Um, and try not to eat anything out of paper boxes um, or, or bags, you know. I mean, I guess you can kind of draw the line at, um, at like uh, grocery store bread if it says like, you know, organic and no preservatives. But even then, I would probably tilt you towards baking your own bread or, um, uh, you know, or you know, have asking the baker in the grocery store, hey, did you, is there anything that's like a preservative in this baguette? Um, so whole food, um, and I think some cheese is fine. Eat your eggs in the morning. Um, uh, you know, more fat is probably better for you than uh, more sugar. Uh, certainly, um, people tend to say, you know, oh well, you know, fruit has you know natural sugar. It's natural. It's good for you. I, that's that's pushing it. I, you know. There are patients out there who have straight up type one diabetes and need insulin. And if they eat a piece of fruit like an apple, it may draw drive their blood sugar farther and faster up than if they eat a Snickers bar. And I've seen that. So I don't know that there's really any safe level of um, sugar period. And I think if you're gonna eat fruit, I would, I would tend to steer you towards blackberries, raspberries, blueberries, and have them be organic. Um, the other starchier fruits, um, I would really go light on, uh, not, and not eat, you know, more than maybe one piece of that a day, uh, at, at the most, but eat your greens, eat your vegetables. Um, yeah, king of the hill, as far as, as vegetables, um, okra, broccoli, cauliflower, uh, cabbage, um, peas, beans, eat your lentils, eat your, uh, beans of all kinds. Um, in addition, the, all those legume families tend to have a lot of inositol, which helps with insulin signaling, and that can really help lower insulin levels, which is really important for our patients with polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, and then starch portions, you want to you kind of limit. I usually say what you can kind of limit to what you could hold in your hand, kind of like like what you could you know would fill an ice cream scoop, and uh, and I think that that would be that's and then fill the rest of your plate with the vegetables and with your other uh, fish. Um, eating fatty fish several times a week, you know, three to five times, maybe even every day, things like salmon and sardines. Um, the omega-3 fatty acids are really critical for baby brain development. Um, Institute of Medicine, which is a big uh, group that, that uh, appoints really knowledgeable people to get together in committees and try to solve problems. They had a, a, a committee that was tasked with looking at the pros and cons of eating fish in pregnancy, because we know that fish have mercury, um, uh, freshwater fish have very little, but, um, you know, some of the ocean going fish that live a long time have, can have a lot of mercury. But what they found in their review of the literature was that the, uh, the need for the omega threes for baby brain development was far more important than worrying about the mercury. Um, so they said, don't try to split hairs, just tell, tell pregnant women to eat more fish. Um, I think you can, you can be, you know, most of our patients are really bright and I think you can be a little more nuanced with that and say, Hey, look, let's eat our salmon and our sardines. These things that are low, low food chain that don't have a lot of mercury and shellfish like shrimp and oysters and things like that. And kind of go easy on the shark and the tile fish and the, uh, um, Patagonian toothfish also known as, uh, um, Chilean sea bass and bluefin tuna, those, those big long, you know, so, the Chilean sea bass don't live, they, they live like 150 years. They're small, but they live a long time, so they acquire a lot of mercury. And then the, um, the, uh, the fish that uh, are really big, like the bluefin tuna that have just eaten tons and tons of fish in a short period of time, they also have a, um, 
a fair amount of mercury. So I would stay pretty clear of those. Um, and then, um, so that's kind of diet. I, you know, you can, I think people can break weak once in a while, you know, I mean, the, the sweets kind of thing. I mean, we've just been conditioned that, you know, it's okay to have sugar around and it's a, it's a wholesome and it's always been there. Well, you know what, even when I was a kid, sugar was really expensive and, you know, it was not the, the, you know, the having massive amounts of like Halloween candy was just not there. It was super expensive. Um, you know, and, and going back in prior generations, you know, sugar was really, it was quite a, a treat. Um, as you probably know, sugar originally was from sugar cane and that's probably the, you know, one of the big reasons why there was that whole triad between the African slave trade, because, you know, you needed bodies to cut all of this cane by hand. So, and then the, the sugar was then used uh, for sale back in Britain and in the Americas, and along with uh, making it into rum, uh, which was also then sold. So, I mean, it, sugar has this long sort of bloody history um, in, in it. Uh, and uh, fortunately then, um, you know, sugar was in pretty short supply all around the world. And then um, after World War II, you know, a lot of the munitions uh, production, you know, stopped and a lot of that gunpowder and explosive production went into making fertilizer because it's not a big jump to switch. Those uh, fertilizers then um, came really pretty inexpensive. And for the first time you could really, you could grow sugar beets with, you know, in a field without having to, you know, get a guy out there, get a, some, you know, poor guy out there with a machete cutting cane, you know, you could just use a tractor to farm these sugar beets. So price of sugar started falling then. Then around 1980, the Japanese figured out how to make a high fructose corn syrup, which is a sweetest sugar. And that was even another order of magnitude uh, less expensive. And that's when you started seeing companies like McDonald's doing the supersizing thing because it was so inexpensive uh, to put, it puts high fructose corn syrup in everything that um, then the, the um, it didn't, really cost them any more to give you a giant cup of soda versus a smaller cup. So um, unfortunately, the high fructose corn syrup appears to be very toxic to your gut bacteria as well. And it's also not registered as a food by your brain. So there's a strange uh, dynamic where when we feed people high fructose corn syrup, they tend to not recognize those calories and they tend to go ahead and eat more anyway. Um, and so this is probably one of the underpinnings behind um, just this whole epidemic that's made us all a lot heavier. Um, the, uh, the other, um, I was going to say about that whole sugar deal. But anyway, so the whole sugar industry, it's evil. Oh, the, you know, a few years ago, a, a dentist had been tipped off that there had been some bad stuff that had happened between the sugar board and some researchers at Harvard. And uh, essentially in the early sixties, the, the sugar producers were starting to face some, some trouble because the dentists were starting to figure out that, Hey, as, as more of the sugar gets out there and it's cheaper, these kids are getting more cavities. So there was a big push to fluoridate water, um, which does decrease cavity risk, but you know, now there's some data that maybe that fluoridated water uh, may uh, decrease IQ a point or two um, in children. So, uh, but anyway, the, the dentist started telling, telling parents, hey, watch your kid's sugar intake and uh, start brushing with this fluoride toothpaste and, and that kind of thing. Well, the, um, then, you know, the people were starting to get heavier. A lot of the physicians started saying, hey, you know, back off on all the sugar that you're eating. And so the sugar board was kind of terrified of this because they were kind of seeing the writing on the wall. So they paid these researchers, these four people apparently, about $50,000 a piece to write review articles to say, hey, look, sugar is fine. It's really fat that's causing this epidemic of heart disease and fat that's causing people to gain weight. And, and really, it is not true. Um, so anyway, years, years later, we are still kind of trying to dig out from this. You know, that's, that's what I was taught in medical school was, you know, you had this food pyramid and at the very top, um, 
or the very bottom, you added carbs. You had all these carbs and you could kind of move up the pyramid and you could have, you know, all this dairy and all this dairy sugar and, and all that was fine. And then at the, you know, you, you want to eat less red meat, and less saturated fat. Well, and certainly, you know, eating tons of saturated fat is not a good idea. Um, uh, but the, the, the real genesis of probably all that heart, that plaque and heart disease stuff was really probably much more the combination of the high sugar diet, which also increases insulin, which is in the growth hormone class and, um, and all of its associated hormones like insulin, like growth factor one, and then, um, uh, other bad fats like saturated fats and, and trans fats, which, um, up until recently were very widely used and are still used in actually in, in cooking most donuts because it's really hard to get a perfect donut that doesn't have a soggy center part but has a nice cooked outer part without using trans fat. So most of the, the big places that uh, make donuts still use trans fats uh, to some degree, which are really, really bad uh, for heart disease and stroke risk. So anyway, so I guess what the, the big point here is um, go easy on the sugars um, and go bigger on your vegetables, leafy greens, organic stuff, um, less fruit, but if you want to have some berries, if you want to have some, you know, 70% cacao dark chocolate here, here and there, hey, I'm, I'm for that too because of the antioxidant. Um, and it's and it's going to be way less bad for you than, than eating, sitting there and eating a bunch of candy. Um, uh, I would go easy on milk. I think cheese is fine. The softer cheeses are fine. Um, we typically tell people once they get pregnant, they're not supposed to eat the, the non-pasteurized cheeses, though. Um, interestingly, though, um, you know, people always ask me, well, gosh, you know, when I get pregnant, should, should I not eat sushi or sashimi, which is raw fish? And, you know, I got to say, never heard of anybody having a miscarriage from that stuff. But we've had now four outbreaks since I've been in my career, at least, where <clears throat> many babies have been miscarried from commercial ice cream uh, because there's an organism called Listeria monocytogenes that can get uh, into those um, ice cream factories. And by the time they, the, by the time Centers for Disease Control realize what's going on, um, you know, many people have been affected by uh, this tainted food. So I would tell you, hey, you know, at least if you're pregnant, I just, I would stay away from ice cream unless you make it yourself. Um, and, uh, yeah. So anyway, so that's the, I think the sort of the thing with nutrition, you know, everybody's a little bit different. Um, you know, for me to lose the weight, you know, I had to really, ra you know, take back a notch my uh, carbohydrate intake um, and fruit. Uh, interestingly, you know, people are always trying to sell exercise as a, as a weight loss uh, remedy, and it is uh, notoriously ineffective for weight loss. Um, unless you Put somebody, you know, put a backpack on somebody and say, "Go hike the Pacific Trail," and uh, we're not going to resupply you with very much food. You know, they're not going to, they're probably not going to lose a lot of weight. So, you know, my recommendation is, you know, we all have pretty busy lives, and you know, having to go to a gym and you know, work out for an hour, if it makes you feel good, if it makes you sleep better, hey, have at it. But it is not necessary. Um, you know, you can get uh, shorter high intensity workouts at home, you know, for at seven to 20 minutes that that, you know, probably accomplish the same thing uh, from a biologic standpoint and uh, save you a whole lot of time and save you having to you know drive all over creation and then having to change out and shower and all that other stuff. So um, I would encourage you to, you know, if you're to do exercise, but mainly because it's really good for mood and behavior. It helps people sleep better, um, you know. People tend to feel so much better that their cravings for other things that are bad for them tend to be less if they're exercising. Um, they tend to feel better about themselves. They tend to, if you look at most people who are exercising, they tend to have better libido, which means they're having more sex, which means their chance of getting pregnant is better. Um, and uh, so, and, 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 and exercise is probably the number one thing for prevention of dementia. So I would encourage you to do some exercise, but um, but I don't think it needs to be this thing. And, and please don't do the, like the HCG diets and stuff like that. That is just like straight up quackery. The, uh, you know, having people take this, you know, sublingually, um, you know, I, who knows what absorption is, but you know, it, 
you know, HCG is like luteinizing hormone. It's going to ramp up male hormone production in women. And that you just, that's not good for eggs. The reason people lose weight on those diets is because they give them 500 calories a day. So if you want to do 500 calorie diet and torture yourself, then do it. But don't pay anybody to do it for you. Um, plus that HCG, you know, it, there's that whole supply demand curve, you know, and the unfortunately, you know, the, with them sopping up a lot of that HCG, it's ra it's raised the cost for our patients who have a legitimate use for it to help them with ovulation from about $35 a dose to now it's over $100 a dose. So, I mean, and it's, and who knows whether it's really effective or not. You never, you never really get any, any clear data on that. Um, again, just weight loss for weight loss sake does not mean that you're necessarily healthier. So, you know, yeah, I think if, you know, if somebody has uncontrolled type two diabetes and horrible arthritis and they're going to die here, then doing bariatric surgery is fair. But, you know, if, if you're considering bariatric surgery and you're not going to do this whole other nutritional component, then you just may be lighter, but you may not really be any healthier. And I think that the the long term data with looking at patients with bariatric surgery for their for their long term health and death rates, it doesn't change a whole lot. And I and I suspect that it's because of that that you have if you have disordered eating on the front end of it and you don't take care of that, you know, overall, then you're not really probably going to affect the overall um, lifespan and health outcomes of people. Um, I have seen patients who had bariatric surgery, though, who've done really well um, to a person, the ones who have done well with an ovulating, getting pregnant, staying pregnant, having a healthy kid, have said, hey, you know, the bariatric surgery jump-started me. It got me out of some bad habits initially, but then I have really changed the way I eat. Um, alternatively, I've had patients who have not done very well with it, but then I'll say, you know, hey, what are you doing? And they're like, well... You know, I figured out that, you know, I can still have my Snickers, uh, but I just have, I, I put my Mountain Dew and Snickers into a Vita Prep and I, and I grind them up and then I can just drink them. And, and that's obviously it's, it's not, not good, not good for anything and, and including the gut flora. So anyway, um, yeah, so I, so I went, I would recommend your focus be on um, just being healthy, worry about the weight loss later, you know, the um, just focus on, um, you know, eating right and uh, trying to make that good gut flora, vaginal flora, endometrial flora as good as you can get it. Get your exercise. You know, a lot a lot of us who've been overweight um, tend to have a uh, there's a psychological component to it. And frequently I see people who are um, overweight who, who are depressed. And so they're their depression is causing them to not sleep as well, which we know increases insulin resistance dramatically. Um, and then, then if you're also depressed, you, you're going to treat yourself. You're either, you're going to treat yourself with alcohol, drugs, um, or food. And, uh, or, you know, some people will treat depression with like extreme exercise, but again, that's not even good for them either. So, um, so if so, be honest with yourself. If you feel like um, you have depression of one way or another, you know, if it's just situational, maybe you've had like something bad happen in your family or to you, and then or you just have had long-standing kind of lower mood, worsen sleep. Then definitely, I encourage you to to seek professional help with that. Talk therapy uh, with a psychologist or psychologist has been shown to be as effective or more effective than um, using antidepressant medication for people with mild to moderate depression. So uh, that talk therapy can be just a, you know, literally a real lifesaver. So I would encourage you to do that um, if you feel like you've got any component of uh, depression to, to uh, what's going on with your uh, situation. Um, going back to the Sleep, uh, sleep is really critical if you're carrying extra weight. There was a recent University of Colorado study where they took super healthy college volunteers. They put them in a testing center, which is basically like a prison. They sleep deprived them and they, and they did it in this way so they know they wouldn't cheat and like take a nap. They would wake them up after five hours. They drew their blood every day. 
They wouldn't let him take naps. After five days, all of them were pre-diabetic. Then they started to gain weight really pretty quickly um, because they weren't restricting. They let them eat whatever they were going to normally eat. So, um, so sleep is really, really important. So I would encourage you to try to get as much sleep as you need. The ballpark for me is I, I'll say, hey, if you were on vacation in a really nice, um, cool, dark room with really nice bedding and it was really quiet, how long would you sleep? And if somebody says, well, I'd sleep like nine hours, then day to day, you really probably need at least eight. Um, the, the shift work that people have to do is just horrendous for their physiology. We know that insulin resistance goes up. We know that they're, that, that actually puts them at higher risk for cancer. Um, some countries in the European Union now are giving cash compensation to government employees who've had to do night work, um, who've gotten cancer. So, I mean, it's, you know, World Health Organization has categorized uh, sleep deprivation as a probable carcinogen. So if you're trying to get pregnant, I would strongly recommend that you get off of swing or night and get on to days um, as fast as you can. If you are stuck having to work nights, I would strongly recommend that you sleep every night or every day during the day. So because you can't flop back and forth, you can't like work three nights. Like, I, you know, we've got all these patients who are nurses and the routine now is they work for 14 hours, three nights a week. And then they try to go back to working or sleeping at night the next time around. And it doesn't work. You just can't do it. it the, so the, on average, those patients are getting about four hours to five hours of, of good sleep a night, which is just not enough. And that's why a lot of them, and most of them will tell you, you know, I started gaining weight when I started having to do nights. And I certainly that's when I started to gain weight was when I was a resident. Um, yeah, I probably I put on that most of that 40 pounds during that time where we were up all night every third night. Um, so um, sleep deprivation is, is really, really corrosive. So I would encourage um, both parties, both men and women to get that really good sleep um, and not short yourself on that because it will make your uh, resi insulin resistance worse. And I have um, a question here. What if everyone you know, including father, gets diagnosed with cancer and you can't be there because you run a daycare? Um, don't understand the question really. Um, so um, the, so yeah, so if you're running a daycare, you probably can't just leave at the drop of a hat to go take care of a family member who's sick. Um, but anyway, the, um, Oh, and the, the point of the question is, will it reduce your chance of pregnancy due to the stress, which is unavoidable? Yeah, it does. It's, it's really bad. Stress is, you know, we all have kind of stressful things in our lives, but, you know, when they start to kind of get to the point where they're like making your blood pressure become abnormal, abnormally high, or you're, um, you know, you're, you're eating, you're now eating poorly to try to treat your stress, um, you know, and I'll have, you know, I have a friend who uh, was playing this video game and it was pretty stressful. It was fun, but it was pretty stressful. But uh, um, he had been staying with us um, for some time and he was playing that game. And I came down in the morning and he'd eaten all the junk food in the house um, because the, the game was so stressful. But um, uh, certainly, you know, it, when things get, you know, out of control, when things go off the rails, um, and certainly things like a bad illness in the family, um, loss of a job, all that kind of stuff are going to affect you so badly that it is a pretty certain thing that egg quality for, for some time is going to be affected in a bad way. Don't know about sperm, but probably, um, the, um, the, I think, you know, the, like what we have, we, like we'll have patients, um, who, you know, like we've had egg donors, for example, and, and recently we had an egg donor who had donated eggs six times or five times, and then she was coming up on her sixth, and she'd always made really, really good quality eggs. And um, on her sixth cycle, she missed an appointment, and we knew that was very unlike her. So 
um, we called and she said, oh, I'm so sorry, I just based my mind, my mother just died. And so in that case, we just cancel that cycle because we know we're not gonna get, the egg quality is gonna be really, really poor. So if you've got something really stressful going on, just try to you know, cone it back, hunker down, just say, hey, look, I'm gonna try to get through this as best I can right now. Um, get, you know, get my family member through this and, uh, and try to forge ahead. But it is, it's, it's pretty awful, you know, for those of us who've lost parents and, you know, I've lost both of mine now, it's a, it's a stressful thing. And, um, you know, even, you know, they're suffering a whole lot at the end of it, you know, you're kind of glad they're not suffering anymore, but, it, but boy, it's really tough to, to have family members be ill. Um, so I wish, it, wish you the best with that. Um, the uh uh you know usually it's a few months of a dig out um eggs are produced on pretty much like about a three month assembly line sperm are about the same so i would say that if you've got a really really stressful period in your life hold off on at least for those for about three months after that um certainly i would take you know coenzyme q10 the 100 to 125 milligrams uh twice a day you know eat your CoQ10 rich foods like sardines, um, take your vitamin D 2000 a day, D3 2000, um, because I think that that'll pri that'll keep you primed for better egg quality when you're finally then ready to try to get pregnant. Um, then there's a question, is there a relationship between in having an extremely low BMI and infertility? And the answer is yes, there is. Um, she says, if so, how do you consult with patients regarding their low weight? Well, so the the underpinnings of why that people tend to have um, lower fertility when their when their body mass index is low is probably based on the brain not sensing enough nutrient going through the hypothalamus that area of the brain it's a very primitive part of our brain but um, there's apparently the this mechanism to really sense our nutritional adequacy um, so a lot of folks, including women who have just kind of a lower food drive and, you know, and that's, frankly, that's what I see most of it. Um, there are people who have anorexia nervosa where they have true eating disorder. They have very disordered body mass image, um, or body uh, image issues. Um, but it seems like that's gotten to be farther and fewer between. I think a lot of those folks are getting treated long before they're, they're, um, getting to the age where they're trying to get pregnant. Um, because it seems like the patients I do see with the, the history of that, they'll talk about it, but they're not struggling with it like now. Um, so a lot of the patients I see who have really low BMI, and what we're talking about is like BMIs at like 16 to, you know, 17 and a half. Um, those folks probably don't ovulate quite as well um, because the, the brain will um, not be able to make as much gonadotropin releasing hormone to cue the pituitary gland to make follicle stimulating hormone well. Um, beyond that, also extremely low BMI people um, tend to have, if you do egg retrievals on them without them getting their nutrition a little bit better, we tend to see um, what our chief embryologist, Dr. Jose Hernandez calls starved eggs. So he'll, it, it, you know, I remember a couple of these cases, I got out of the egg retrieval and he came up to me and go, what did you do to that patient? Did, you know, she has starved eggs. And, um, and uh, in a couple of those cases, it was, um, and one in particular, I remember it, there was an egg donor who had donated before, had very good egg quality. This is when we were doing a lot of fresh embryo transfers. And the couple of times before that she had donated, people got pregnant right away and did fine, um, her recipients. Um, but then she'd moved away, she'd, she'd, um, uh, gotten a boyfriend who was a vegan and he had convinced her to be a vegan. And so she was doing her, her monitoring for her, uh, her donor egg cycle or third cycle out of town. And, um, so we weren't looking at, we weren't seeing her, we were just seeing her ultrasound pictures, which looked fine and, and her hormone levels. And so when she came down for the retrieval, I was like, Whoa, you're like 25 pounds lighter. And she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm being a vegan. And, and eggs were horrible. The none of them fertilized very well. It was this, this humongous loss of um, money for the uh, for the couple, 
um, you know, we felt badly about it and, and uh, redid that cycle for them. And then it worked out and they had kids, but, but yeah, it, you know, having, being really low BMI is, is really not, not great. So how I tend to deal with that is I try to tell people, you know, obviously if they have like anorexia, you know, I, I think we need psychiatric intervention with that and an extensive psychotherapy to, to try to, you know, get those folks in a better place where they are more accepting of seeing a little bit of additional weight on themselves. But then for the low food drive people, I, I try to tell them, you know, like have popcorn with butter and olive oil on it. So eat, eat like what you're going to eat normally, but just try to take that fat intake up a notch. And if we can get them about three to 400 more calories a day, um, cheese is another good one that I'll use, you know, another high density thing that doesn't take up a lot of room in their gut. Um, we can usually, you know, get them into that zone to where, um, they'll, even if they don't gain weight, they'll tend to ovulate better and they'll tend to have better quality eggs. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of how, um, that's how I, you know, approach it. And we've been pretty successful with that. The, uh, I, I kind of took that approach because I, I talked one time with this guy who worked at the, it was a researcher at Oregon Primate Research Center. And it turns out that, that chimpanzees love running. So the, they, they look forward to it. So, you know, the, you know, like humans, we're like the only people who are like, I like being sedentary, you know, most, you know, these other species, like I was talking with somebody today about, you know, this working dog, this police dog, and, you know, like the dog has to be moving when it's out of its kennel. I mean, it's not used to just sitting around. But anyway, these chimps, they run, they love running. So you can put them on a treadmill and they'll run. But after about five months, you can get well, most of them will just stop having menstrual periods. They kind of exercise themselves into that sort of hypothalamic dysfunction. And so this researcher was was saying the way they got them back to ovulating was they would give them different flavored granola bars as another separate treat. So they had, and they had to keep changing, changing them because after a while, after a few days, they'd be like, oh, I, I, this cashew one, I've had it for all these days. I'm not going to eat it, you know, and then they wouldn't get the extra calories. And so they had to keep rotating that around. So um, whatever extra little treat food we can get for people, even if it's not the most healthy. I mean, obviously, you know, the things that are really super processed, like the Flamin' Hot Cheetos and Takis and all that garbage, that's really bad for gut bacteria. So don't go there. But, you know, organic popcorn with butter and olive oil, I think is perfectly fine. Um, and certainly if you're going to break weak and you want to have a snack, if you're carrying extra weight, that's the one to have, I think. Um, but anyway, um, if anybody has any other questions, um, you know, feel free because I think that's that's kind of what I got on it. But um, to wrap up, you know, love yourself. You know, there's all the shaming stuff, all the stuff that, you know, people, um, you know, making fun of people who are heavier. Or, you know, it, it's it's garbage. And, you know, you you know, there's only one of you. You should love yourself and, um, you know, you know, be happy. And, uh, you know, have a, have a happy life. That's, that's the main thing. All right. So next Hutchison's Huddle will be Tuesday, September 10th at 7 p.m. Topic will be polycystic ovary syndrome as September is polycystic ovarian syndrome awareness month. So um, that's pretty cool. Um, I hope Congress had a play in that. Uh, uh, Hopefully next they'll tackle uh, putting taxes uh, like uh, cigarettes on uh, sodas and uh, junk food. But anyway, um, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, again, um, look you know look look back on our Facebook thing for other uh, other of these uh, discussions and uh, let us know if you have any questions or you have any suggestions for other uh, topics to go over because I'd be happy to to go over do. Um, lit searches, and then approach to individual topics if uh, you all have an interest. Thanks. Bye.